Welcome everyone to One Million Mind. Today we have a great show. I'm excited that all of you joined us. How are you, Balaji? Doing awesome, man. I uh, finally got through this cold spell. It's warming up a little bit, feeling energized and ready to go. Perfect, yes. We, we had a hail and uh, tornado warnings last night, so it was exciting. But it's sunny outside, a beautiful day, Friday, yeah. can't complain. So I know we right. have a action packed. Uh, I'm really excited about seeing what you have for us. So I'm going to give some quick updates about just the general state of the market and uh, just state of AI, and then we can get started because I want to spend as much time as we can through your, um, uh, your piece of it. So let's get started. So one of the things I'm very excited about, because I mean, I think from an AGI perspective, that is we are 10, 30 years away, right? So if I'm looking at more short term, six months to a year, what are things I see that are exciting and uh, gives me excited every time I read about this topic is GPT-4 is coming, right? I think um, the LLM models are uh, really going to get better in the next couple of years. So I think GPT-3, two to three was about a, three-year time frame. I know 3.5 got released. They're saying the one that was released with Bing AI is closer to what four is going to be. Just That's just one side of things. But now there's competition. A lot of generative AI tools are coming out in the May, June time frame. So it's like uh, Christmas coming early for me. So there's uh, the DeepMind Sparrow, Google Bard, uh, and, the, and Microsoft is adding Bing AI. There's GitHub Copilot. They just all kinds of improvements going to happen in this space, right? So that's just something to look forward to. And how do we leverage? Do we make our bet with the one particular generative AI? I want to step back and look at all of them and pick one and just if I'm going to build something, I'm going to try to figure that out. But also, what just the, yesterday I think I read about this is now there are APIs for so Chat GPT and Whisper uh, API, which is Whisper, text to yeah. speech conversion. Mm -hmm. is, it can do multiple languages. I want us to, at some point, talk through this. How can we do that? And the same thing we are doing right now can be converted to different uh, languages. I would love to do that as an experiment. But the bottom line is that the APIs are coming, and that is going to reduce cost by 90%. So again, I haven't played around with the APIs, but it just blows my mind. It just came out, and already, like, if you can reduce cost by 90%, that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think, especially with the Whisper API and and the and the speech to text in, in specific, right? How effective um, in the past? I think they we always had this Google te speech to text or IBM Watson or IBM speech to text or whatever the combinations are. Um, the accuracy ratio was somewhere eighty five to ninety percent, um, and the industry specific words were not recognized. Like if you run it through medical mm -hmm. dictionary or healthcare provider stuff. Um, I'm very eager to see the newer ones to see how how well of, how good a, good a job they do because I think that's that has potential to disrupt the transcription industry as a whole. I mean, it takes what, like three bucks per minute to transcribe something in a professional basis. Uh, and if it's a if whisper is what, like 0 0.06, what or 0 0.06 per, per yes. minute? So uh, it's a it's a huge difference, but again, the question really is: Does it stand up to that level of accuracy? Because you don't want to read a medicine name different or a technical term different and, <laughs> and cause a, cause a major problem. Yeah, that's that's like the high end of the market, right? But if you go down to just shows like as podcast hosts, they all like for example, one of the things we can do is like once we finish this, we can upload this a video to rev.com. And then they'll get the whole um, between the computer and the human. There's to your point. There's a cost involved. They'll give you the transcripts, and then you can use that for either a blog post or a medium article, or make it a part of your um, upload to YouTube. So when somebody we watched, should try that. If, yeah, if you can upload this, and someone will give us the transcript, see how good that is. Yeah, we should totally do that. See what 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 it comes back. Okay, so that's what we can do with the uh, whisper API, and then we can try to convert that. We can speak in. The, English, but what if another language subtitled with a different language? So I'm excited about all the options it opens up. But just because we touched on this, uh, I think we did this a while ago was the um, Eleven Labs, I think it was called, where I gave my voice 
sample right. and gave it a text. Right. I was able to read in your, having, yeah, in your voice. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. Exactly. Now they're doing generative voices. What that means is this voice doesn't exist. You can tell them, I want the Caucasian 60 year old man with a very high energy reading this. Or you can say it has to be uh, African American 19 year old reading this with low energy, whatever, right? And you create a voice and it can read it with that. So you can make it Morgan Freeman ish if you want to without calling it that. But the bottom line is, just like you use images and stock uh, photos and stuff where the face doesn't exist, and I think we showed something like that, or the resume doesn't exist. Now there's a voice doesn't exist. You can create your own voices. So I'm I'm excited about all the options because we let's say we talk this, right? it comes out as text. We put it through that, and we can convert it into a different language and uh, make it like a Spanish local person speaking that. The options are endless, so I'm I'm excited about trying that. So I would love for us to test that in the in a future episode. Absolutely. And the last piece is about uh, yeah. One uh, thing uh, uh, one thing I heard was that um, this is funny, right? Most uh, most movie actor actresses they they have not copyrighted their voice, so it's kind of open for use. They have uh, probably protected their image, they have protected their videos, but not necessarily the voice. So basically, you can take any probably uh, available actor but again maybe sometimes they get dubbed into the movie so it doesn't make sense but there are people who actually speak in their own voice right so and it, i i didn't realize that was not protected by their contract or whatever it is that's interesting it is because nobody so now just going to build on that right because now we can let's say rajnik or tom cruise right they at some point they're going to get old what if you can sell your likeness to uh, uh, to people? Let's say, hey, you can use my likeness for the next 20 years. Let's say you make 10 movies out of it. Just give me $100 million right now. Then right, you right. For the next 10. Yeah. So there's so much option because I know there's some aging actors who would love to cash out or at least use a likeness to make uh, movies, which now they can't act. So I think, right. I think we are just barely scratching the surface on all the options. But I want us to try, um, you know, at least testing some of these. So and that's where the next line is uh, now Zapier and chat um, GPT. There's some connections so you can build um, Zapier, Zapier, whichever one. Uh, you can build apps faster. So there mm -hmm. are infrastructure moves happening with the APIs of Zapier that somebody who doesn't have to be super technical can build this. And prices are dropping. I just feel like it's a great inflection point the next six months or year where amazing products are going to come out and i want us to be able to build one of these two products uh, along the way right so absolutely i think it's a, certainly certainly part? yeah interesting times right it almost feels like the the next wave of uh, innovation we are at the cusp of that and things are going to dramatically change yes i'm excited about it i mean what we're seeing right now with it blowing people's mind I can only imagine. I mean, I know there's 90 percent who are impressed with it, 10 percent who are pointing to fatal errors it makes. But we have to understand this is not the last step of the journey, right? Being three GPT three, how will it be in GPT ten? I can't even wrap my head around how that's going to be, right? See, the the bigger question I have is, um, you know, we cover the crypto, we cover the AI. I think the regulation is now due on the AI side because. Who's there to say companies like Microsoft and Google will use it in a more uh, inclusive sense? How do we, yeah, how do we even know? So, so now the, there's going to be regulation on the AI because without that, this can go, this can get very complicated. So, I, I think regulation is going to come to, come to AI too at some point. It is. It is going to be a tough. Um... Just like they're catching up on crypto, they're gonna have to catch up on AI. Uh, I think something bad has to happen for it to get, what I mean by that is once they, there's a lot of collapses, but the big one was FTX. As soon as that happened, there's a heightened visibility into everything blockchain, crypto, right? Right, right. Something along those lines will happen. Like for example, when Tesla, even the Super Bowl, we saw two commercial about Tesla called running into mock kids walking across. All I'm saying is, Something big has to happen before uh, you know the focus turns here because there's no way they can keep up with the speed at which it's going. But right. there will be some things coming in. Um, I want to hopefully nothing terrible happens, but uh, I expect 
some kind of guardrails coming in sooner in this space too. So, yeah. So that's one thing. And I want to the next uh, topic I want to cover is uh, this. This is all positive, right? The, the, the flip side of it is uh, um, is what is our um, take on. So this is where AI and crypto AI is in every place. There. So the interesting part I was reading about a lot of the VC investments and pitch books and pitch deck, sorry, is you, everybody's adding AI or something to there to make their product or idea more sell sellable, right? Just because right. that is a new wave, we just all put it in there. So as you can tell, NFT D uh, DeFi projects are all using tokens and some of these are the, some of the hardest cryptocurrencies this year. So how many of these are more of a riding the wave, a pump and dump? I don't know the answer to it. But what's right. interesting is there are actual companies making valuable products. We talked about Grab, we've talked about Singularity, we talked about this Ocean Protocol. But I'll just show you, right? Like the next slide is what, I mean, we can read through that, but the next slide is very, look at the how, how well they've done just this, in the last 30 days to seven days, right? Again, none of this is financial advice, but what I'm saying is if you and I, just for fun of it, did it, there are, some of them are up like almost 100% in the last 30 days. So right. when asked, turned around and asked the opening, I think Sam, they asked him about, hey, what is this, is this real, right? So they were, right. uh, he was very skeptical about it, right? Like this is, so really the, the, the throughput that you need for AI solutions to work, blockchains can't support. Then they they're not technology that can be combined. They might have their own values, but I know people are trying to merge them to make a quick buck here and there. So I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Where do you stand on this? Is this really a technology that can be combined? Are they there's some similarities, but they really are their own two parallel tracks? Where do you land on that? Right. I think much of the debate is, I think, even with uh, the the previous generation or last decade of crypto uh, platforms and infrastructure or everything else that's out there, the question is scalability, right? So that's going to show up everywhere because unless it is tested, nobody knows whether it's going to scale. Um, so I would kind of put that in the common fear type of thing. Is anything new or is it going to scale? But if you take that out of the picture and look at it as a, as a how can how can blockchain facilitate some of these things, right? So I think it comes to the same concept, core concept of decentralization. How can we get more community involved? Um, all of those apply to any technology. It doesn't matter whether it's AI or not. So uh, the task here is always going to be figuring out who who's doing real work and who's doing put an AI sticker on it to sell something, right? Um, I think some of the <laughs> some of the older projects like Graph and uh, again, I, I I don't think there's a direct relation to AI, but it just got as you can see, it got pumped because it, it it's a it, it started out as a cross blockchain data gatherer and it's kind of sort of a Google for multi blockchains and things like that, right? So, um, but people can see that how that can transform itself if it wants to to something more um, AI related data as well. Um, so, I think. The long and short of it is, I think there are some real work um, that that can go into how to take anything that's happening in the centralized world. How can I make it decentralized, right? That's why we I just brought up that regulation in the in the first slide, right? Mm -hmm. Because the moment a regulation comes in, the question really becomes like, uh, is it even before regulation comes, you know, whether the politicians get enough time to get there before something bad happens, like you said, what does people do when they want some amount of fairness in any of this, right? So you can already see, right, uh, Elon is probably starting another project saying oh, the, the open AI is now Microsoft or whatever influence. Now I'm going to fund fund another one for the sake of keeping it more, uh, more open. Um, so these type of um, activity will always be there. And there is a need for it to keep checks and balances, right? So, so that there's not like one person monopolizing and trying to extort everything else. Um, so a lot of these things, I think, play a big role. So as you can see, I think this this is just a snapshot of where people immediately, it's a momentum play, I think. It's just people saw, okay, where, where are the quick picks <laughs> to run this? Um, but also some of these are um, looking like uh, 
addressing real needs. So that's my personal opinion. I think there's there's some, especially the ocean protocol for data. I, I think it's it's boring, but but it's it's a very very much required. Right? Yeah. So it's it's our millions of followers who've moved the market is what I want to believe, but no. <laughs> so so next time you do the research, we need to talk about it because I was looking at it from a academic thing, right? It was very interesting to say that we talked about it and these these were the AI blockchain intersections uh, ideas or that you brought about it. Just I just thought it was interesting that it came up. So yeah, well, Alitia, yeah. even even I, before. I, I, even before the AI blew up, right, Alitya was doing um, NFTs, which are more animated type of thing, right? So, um, oh, really? if, right. So, I think uh, that's that's one project that started even before the open AI boom. Um, I think they took the traditional traditional picture NFT and then said, okay, now I'm going to add a, a character to it. They call it a character NFT or character GPT or whatever they want to call it. But um, how can I how can I have it more interactable? And it's an NFT, and it personifies something. Um, so I, I think these are some of the interesting ones for sure. Yeah, this is always a bull market somewhere, right? So that's what this shows. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and wake, we'll wake up again today. The dollar is increasing. The water is becoming strong, and the the Bitcoin is dropping, and the and the government is raising interest rates. It, it just keeps in in check, keeps moving up and down. It is all right. So th those are the kind of the general conversation I wanted to have. Just things that I see in the market, and uh, thank you for uh, you know watching this with us, guys. So let's to go to our most important topic that Balaji has been showing me offline, and it's blown my mind. So I want to hand it off to Balaji to walk us through. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so again, this is I think between me and Rajni, we were discussing how can we start playing with some of this um, hands-on approach, how to play with this, right? So so um, uh, what we are about to see is a, is a short movie clip. Um, Rajini was kind enough to get his son act it out, right? And say, hey, Balaji, can we take this and try to morph it into a character, right? That's a little project that we were playing with for a while. And it, um, it took me through certain uh, experimentation and then just here to discuss some of my findings and what's probably the shortest way. Again, I'm still trying to figure the actual workflow where we can get it to a place where it's going to act out like a single character, which is uh, apparently now after playing with it for probably good a good 48 hours, it, it's a difficult thing to do to keep it stick to a, a single type of looking character. But uh, it's almost there. Um, so I'll just show what what uh, I've been doing. So the first step, I think, to, to let's see what we need to get this all going, right? So what are the requirements, right? So first thing is you need a very good high frame rate camera. I think Rajini's camera is 60 frames a second. That's a pretty decent job. But I, after looking at, um, looking at some of the key frames, I thought maybe to do an even better job, you need like 250 or whatever that's available in the market, like pick up the highest frame rate. Because um, the, one of the mm -hmm. first things, first steps you need to do in all of these projects is take a movie clip that's acted out with a green screen, let's say, and extract all the frames. And it's going to create hundreds of PNG images or JPEG images. Um, there's known ways to do this uh, with the After Effects or Photoshop or any other uh, video tool that you have. I used Shortcut to create, take a movie, create all the frames. So, got it. Um, so let's um, so let's see what happened. So essentially, organized here. Um, so, um, so essentially, I got a movie, right? The original movie, which is basically a short clip, um, which I took it and transformed it into a bunch of frames. So this is what happens yeah. if you have, so if you have 60 frames a second, how many seconds do the math, you end up with whatever amount of frames. Yeah, so you get, okay. So you, this is the first step you need to do to get, get uh, stuff moving. So once you have this, now you can see the, the, the change in pulse. 
right? So whenever it changes um, in a certain dramatic way, you start selecting those out as a keyframe for generating some character. So uh, like for, I mean, again, I'm just looking at one is a unique pose to start with. Then let's say somewhere along the line, it changes here, 30. And then maybe every 15 or 30 frames, there is something changing. Maybe pick them out. So you don't have to work on all these frames. Um, and then create a short list, right? So again, I picked a bunch of them just to uniquely represent the different poses in this particular short video, right? So I can start playing with the with the um, rendering engine from the table diffusion and other uh, things. So, so now we got the movie. From movie, we got the individual images. And from individual images, now we got to individual pictures of interest. Um, because you don't want to miss a transition here because the, the, the way the these systems work is you have to feed it um, a clear cut uh, image of uh, transition, right? And and it otherwise you'll end up with something masking or it'll try to interpolate and it, it'll probably have a tearing off effect of a face or uh, things that are <laughs> hidden. So so um, been through that in uh, one of the experimentation. So, um, so you end up with this. Then the next step is to go to, again, I'm not running this stable diffusion, but um, because it's taxing on my GPU and while I'm doing this, but I'll show you. So essentially you, Run your lock. I run local instance because I have a NVIDIA card um, on my PC here, uh, RTX 3090. But there's for people who don't have PC, you can always choose. There's a lot of Google Colab um, links that are available on the net. You can go find them and you can run it with a Google account on their servers, right? So you don't need a PC to run this if you don't want to, but you can pay as you go type of thing. Uh, on Google Cloud. Um, so in my case, I have a PC with, with some decent computing power for GPU power. Um, so essentially, that's what I did. So the next thing you need is to figure out what is the prompt. Like, what am I trying to do yeah. here, right? So I take one of the keyframes I extracted, and I'm saying, hey, uh, I want this, this represents a boy with sunglasses, and I want manga style art, warrior armor suit, all these. Things, the, the list of things that I want. Now, I want to bring to attention now the model files, right? Stable diffusion can ingest a lot of model files from different sources. Again, I think this is where a lot of people are getting very creative. Um, so there's Mid Journey, which is a popular one, and Stable Diffusion itself has a, a 1.5 version model. Uh, this is a 2.1. So, but then the the these are, I think, very, I played with this very early on and didn't give me the quality. So then I went to these kind of mid-journey and protogen. So these are very specialized, uh, high resolution uh, pictures and animations and things like that. So I kind of downloaded these. Each one is is a four to five gig or even some of them seven gigs of data. Oh, wow. so you just, yeah, you just download them and throw it into a folder that Stable Diffusion has called a model folder. So now I have a decent set of models that I can play with to see what happens if I give the same prompt and what kind of images. So uh, immediately I realized with the standard, let's say it's stable diffusion 1.5, the kind of pictures it came up with were, were kind of flat, right, 2D. Now with some of these models, because they are trained on some 3D art and other things, um, it comes out with a, with a photorealistic uh, effect. Um, so for example, uh, maybe not this example, but I'll, I'll pull that one shortly. So another key thing you, you notice is that um, there's a keyword trigger. Some of these customized models people develop, they, I think this is where I think a lot of creativity is gonna happen and people are gonna train custom models and merge them into the main stable diffusion model, right? So this kind of gives you the best of generic and specific, um, but to trigger that, there's a keyword like in this case, this is a model shoot style. So this keyword generates certain type of art. Um, so every one of these models, they have these kind of keyword triggers when they train. So when you use them as a consumer, you can specify, I need that. So I think if you start looking at that, you can visualize, okay, if I am a character developer, right? I can sit and draw a bunch of images, I rotate. Uh, 
let's say I have a few hundred images of my character in various poses. I can train a model and name it um, Balaji's uh, warrior model or whatever it is. It's a trigger word and merge it into the main stable diffusion checkpoint model file and let people consume. Now, they'll get everything from the stable diffusion, but when they really want biology warrior, they can type that keyword in there. It'll trigger that particular uh, style. And is there a way for you to monetize it though, when you create your model or you just contribute I, to a general? I think that's, that's where I think it's going to go. That's my prediction, right? So now that I see this, yeah. I think if, if there's this debate about, oh, all these uh, artists are going to lose their jobs and, but I don't think that's the case. I think what's happening is it's morphing it into a case where it's reducing the amount of work they have to put in, right? So they don't have to painstakingly draw every animation steps and things like that. Mm -hmm. They come up with a character which is unique and they learn how to train one of these models and you put up the model for sale, right? So it, it either generates royalty. If it's blockchain, maybe it'll generate some, uh, some revenue for every ask from a customer, like a person like me who wants to generate some movie out of that character, I may pay royalty. If it's regular, then it's subscription. There's different ways, right? So I think soon enough artists will, will figure out how to get these models going because that's the real power, right? You just, because until now, what happens, right? You see a, you see a art and you have to go back to the artist and say, hey, can you, here's a sample movie of my kid uh, playing this and can you generate art for me? And that person is gonna sit there and do all this stuff. That's that's. I think if you're creative, I, if I wear the creative hat for a second, I would rather do more creative work than tedious manual repetitive work. They are doing it right now because there's no other way. But enter this. I think that's going to save a lot of time. Keep creative people creative. They'll continue to do creative. Mm -hmm. um, so Maybe. anyway, so that's the. So I okay. So from here. I want to show. So one of the cool things with the with the stable diffusion is this feature, where you can do a X Y plot. Um, let me see if I quickly can walk through a few parameters here. So there's two things of important here, which are importance that I'm playing with CFG scale, which basically what it translates to is this prompt that you have. How enforcing or how much strength do you want to give the prompt in the rendering? Right, so it, it, it goes from one to 30 here, right? So so depending on what value you choose, it has the potential to influence the output. So this is something to think about. How Again, you want to stay on rails, right? Like this is stay. Yeah, how enforcing. Important. Correct. How uh, enforcing. Perfect. The denoising strength is, a, is the amount of randomness. So what happens is if the denoising strength is zero, it's as good as the input is output. If the denoising strength is one, basically it says AI, you do whatever you want with this thing, right? So it gives complete freedom. So in a way to explain, but it's a, it's a it's the amount of randomness. So the problem here is this, I spent first, uh, before I discovered the script uh, that's there, I, I spent probably a good hour trying combinations of this, it's just a very tedious process. Because what happens is you have to hit the right sweet spot, sweet spot for your image. Uh, otherwise you might get up, uh, get some mangled features or some noise in there. Um, I'll explain what that. So with the script, what it does is you can do X, Y plot of, of the scale to the strength. So here I have supplied some value. So basically I'm saying, I want a plot of images for these prompt strength values, 7, 8, 10, 11, 13, 15, and denoising values of from 0.5 to 0.75. See what happens if I ask it to be more creative versus if I want it 50-50 creative. Um, what it'll do is it'll come up with a grid. This is really useful. I think this is where you start next because you need to pick a character. You need to know what values are going to work for you. Okay, so... The first one I am showing here, I didn't mention the word sunglasses. So without sunglasses, it put a mask, right? That's one of the mistakes I did. So you don't see sunglasses here, right? Because I forgot that keyword in the prompt. Um, but you can see as the prompt strength increases versus um, the denoising. So the bottom most, let me see if I can zoom this in. So 
So you can see the bottom most is, um, is this, where it has complete freedom. It put a mask, it created a character, it tries to stick to whatever you have, but it, it had complete freedom to do whatever. Um, versus on the top left, you still see sort of resemblance of a T-shirt, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's trying to stay close to the image you're giving uh, with some uh, uh, rendering of. So, um, <clears throat> so that's the variety. You can plot depending on whatever your needs are. And you can see the images changing as the as the strength of the prompt versus the how amount of randomness. So this is one of the key steps that's needed again um, to shorten your experimentation, right? Um, so the next thing, I tried it with two different model files. So now I put the keyword sunglasses, so it actually looks like the original image, um, and I'll show you cases where when the model file is, uh, so again, some of these model files are really good, even at a higher noise level, it's not mangled up. Um, I thought I had one where the hands are twisted. Oh, maybe the third one. Okay, so you can see in this, <clears throat> as you keep increasing the strength, you get to some scenes where either you have like a half armor, half skin revealed, uh, or in general, you can see the pose change. You see, this is pretty much um, looking at you, the first one versus the bottom most is sideways. So it's, it's, it's changing the pose. So these kind of artifacts are going to be observed depending on the model file, right? So that's why this kind of a plotting is important to pick because if you arbitrarily pick something, you're going to end up playing with it for a very long time. So. Uh, ideally, you want to choose your values and plot it. This takes some time. But once it's done, then you pick, okay, I like the number CFG11 and denoising 6, right? Let's go. Then you have that fixed. Um, the next task at hand, right? So once you figure that out, then generate your image, right? You don't need the, you don't need the script. You can disable the script. And then you go generate your image. And then the next step is to figure out what the seed is. What is the actual value that will get the same output every time? Um, sorry, I think I disabled the, the. So it'll open up. Once you open up, it'll give you the seed. Um, I'm just having a web page here, but I don't run the table diffusion. So you copy the seed, which is a number, right? And go to batch processing and input the seed and provide the input directory of your frames, give an output directory and let it do its thing. So the seed is the real key because the, it, it has to be a single value that you want to go after to prevent a lot of variations. It took me a while to figure that out reading all this material, but because the earlier experiments would come up with all kinds of variations, right? It just, because the seed is random, it is free to choose yeah. whatever it renders. It could be looking like the same character, different character. So now I am able to get to very similar looking character, though it's not perfect. It does not give me the flexibility to fix the costume or the dress or the, some aspects of um, sunglasses and things like that. But the character for the most part with the seed sticks to the same value and behaves. In fact, that's gonna be my next experiment to figure out how do I keep the character the same? There's a lot of other techniques like in painting, out painting, there's more experimentation. But so that's what I did and I'll share the like share the a results. lot of work. It, it, it is a lot of um, a lot of learning curve, right? I think the actual work is done by the computer. Right? It just takes one hour to but higher. Now power. that you've done it for a week, I mean, I know you spent a lot of hours on it. I'm like, so you have a workflow, but you do you still have to go through? Let's say you get another. That was just a thirteen second video. Now you get a two hour video. You still, do you still have to split into those frame, pick key ones, and then now you might have your model ready with the CFG and all that, right? Can you feed it? Or what I'm saying is how repeatable is this process is really my question. Yeah, so far, the, the process, the repeatable process is this, right? So let's summarize. So I take yeah. a movie file. If you give me another movie file, I'll take it, it's, uh, feed it to the shortcut and say, give me all the frames, right? Then I go through the yeah. frames to pick, pick uh, changes, like where it's changing. Because you need that because you have to run through, before you run your bad job, I recommend 
taking those like a handful of keyframes that you think are changing uh, from scene to scene and run it through the same seed. See if it comes up with a very similar character. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it changes things or mangles it or hand goes off or chopped off. So you have to make sure the character you pick behaves for all the frames before you run the bad job because the bad job is going to probably run for one hour, two hours. Um, you don't want to waste that time. So you, this gives you opportunity to quickly take a look. Is it going to behave? Because these things are changing. When I change this, is the character going to stay? That's why you want to separate this. Otherwise, you can just blindly pass all the 100 images. And uh, But you are going to end up end up waiting. And then, trust me, I did that too. I waited one hour. Like, oh, I don't like this. Now I have to go. So now that's why I'm saying it's better to pick these keyframes and run a spot check on the character before you actually run the bad job. Because bad job is going to take time. So, it makes sense. Okay, cool. So that's uh, that's essentially what I learned, right? And again, the workflow is not complete, right? Um, I, I'll explain why. Um, one thing to watch out for, like I said, I would have preferred after this, I thought 60 key frames per second is high. It's fun, right? Then soon enough, I found images or frames where the hand movement is fuzzy. The moment the system looks at a hand with a fuzzy, like a moving hand, like with a shake, it is trying to put some objects. It's it's not showing fingers. It's doing other things, right? So that's why it's important, right? It's a so the equipment is important too. If you if you have the highest frame rate at the best price you can get, I, I, I think it's preferable. Sixty frame is still high. Um, maybe there's a sports mode. I don't know. It's um, maybe I have a way to show what I mean. Give me a second. Um, I had one of these frames. Uh, you can do avatar anytime soon. Is what he's saying? Until I buy expensive camera. That's right. So look at this frame. So I extracted from your 60 frames a second. I still end up with one of the frames. Oh, like, right. So you can see everything is clear except for the hand. Um, so this kind of because the hand is moving from bottom to top uh, and it does not mm -hmm. give with 60 frames a second. I think maybe moving fast enough that it produces this fuzzy image. Right. Um, so the good thing is some of these models are able to correct some of these aspects and come up with something decent. But if, if it is not able to, then the problem is because it's not clear whether it's a hand or the hand holding something else type thing. Um, all right, so let's go for the big reveal. The big reveal then, I'm excited. All right, so I'm going to show side by side, side by side how, um, how the original and the morphed image looks like. Um, so the original, so I'm going to play both of these so you can see. Um, so again, I went through the same process, picked a character. Um, it, for the most part, sticks to the face, uh, looking very similar throughout that few seconds of clip. Um, but you can see how the costume changes. That is pretty epic. There you oh go. Oh my goodness. So that's essentially yeah. the output of it. Um, so one of the other things that I had to do, again, because again, as you go deeper and deeper, there's definitely more work right now. If I'm hand picking, I'm removing these keyframes that are fuzziness, right? So I, So what happens when you start removing some things, the output is not that smooth because now you lost one frame out of 69 in that second, 60 in the second, right? So um, there is, I found another software which is really valuable. <clears throat> it's called the D-A-I-N Dane app, which basically takes a movie and extrapolates the frame to smooth it out. So essentially it does not produce that because I removed some keyframes to adjust it so the model is able to work with it. Now I have to fill in those frames to get a smooth effect, if that makes sense. As if I take out of 30 frames a second, if I take 15 out because they are fuzzy, this software is able to inter interpolate and create those 50 frames so you can still have a smooth looking movie. So you might need that at the end because if you go deeper, then yeah, you're throwing some pieces out and editing and how do you end up with a smoother looking video, right? There's a tool for that. Um, that's the Dane app, which is, a, which is a good point. So that's all I got. I think that's that's the type of effect you can produce. That was amazing. So just to kind of build on it. So once you finish it, if you were going to build a, 
a short movie or, uh, or play or whatever right? with this transformation you get the characters act so the green screen now can be passed through the green screen replacement then you can make that character appear anywhere yeah. is that so i found right? okay. yeah absolutely i think um um there's a lot of um python based tools right you can run in the same ecosystem as the stable diffusion install right i i found one for background removal so what you can do is um you, you take all those again you take the final movie that you produce with the green screen mm -hmm. extract um the process is like this, right? You're operating on individual frames. The stable diffusion also takes a batch of in individual frames and gives you individual frames. Then finally, you have to combine them all, combine them into a movie. So before you do that, what you can do is take those images and pass it through background remover a Python library that that you have, and it mm -hmm. removes all the back the green screen, right? It gives you transparent PNGs. So once you have transparent PNGs, then you can use software like After Effects or whatever to play something behind and create a smooth, smooth video on top of it. Um, so I haven't tried that yet, but I found the that's another piece of puzzle that I have to figure out, right? So, but I found the piece where I can create transparent images. So remove the background, it creates transparent images. Then what happens, right? Then you have to now substitute the background. That's the next step. I think a lot of software out there will let you do that. As soon as you remove the background, you can throw something in the back. That was very cool. I know you spent a lot of hours on it. So thank you for walking us through that. That's a lot of experimentation. And uh, I didn't understand all of the CFG earlier, but now I'm just you showing the difference between that was very helpful to me. So whoever is watching, if they want to recreate it, that will be great. Again, they make it look, so I'm pretty sure the tool and the workflow will continue to get better, like we said about the, as the underlying system evolved. I'm, I can't wait to see what else uh, somebody like with the NVIDIA card and a. You don't even need it. I think you just if you just need a Google account. As long as you have a Google account where you can you can pay per use, uh, that's that's definitely that's an option. If you don't need necessarily uh, expensive. It's not. A, it's a gaming PC, right? You don't need a gaming PC to play with all of this. Just uh, go Google. We'll post some of those links in the in the video that we post in our uh, One Million Minds, so you can people can use it. There's a lot of collab uh, playbooks, right? You can click play, and it'll come up with a stable diffusion page, just like I have. It's just not running on my PC. It's running on the cloud, and you can even yeah. run it in a powerful machine. That was very cool. Thank you again, Balaji. That was I, I enjoyed it. I know my son's gonna freak out when he sees the before and after. So uh, excited to show this to him, and I think he's gonna put it on his channel for his face reveal. So it's gonna be interesting anyway because cool. he's never like he was a kid, right? never showed it, but now he wants to transition to a actor. So I'm like, okay, you know what? It's time. So, uh, but anyway, it was just mind-blowing everything you did. So I appreciate it, and thank you everybody for uh, staying with us. And I'll see you guys next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.